you ever find that in your warehouse you have dead stock? You can't sell it, no one wants to buy it, and you can't get a refund on it. Or alternatively, you're missing inventory in your warehouse that you need. You've got sales coming in and you're low on stock and you haven't ordered more stock in time. All these things hit profit and I've been there. I've run my own Shopify store and had exactly that problem. But we've partnered it up with Inventory Planner who have the most incredible app to help you manage that and forecast exactly what products, what SKUs, even down to what color of product you need to order in advance to make sure stock levels remain consistent throughout. They're also running a seven day boot camp. And if you wanna go and sign up to that, it's seven emails every seven days. And it takes the same amount of time as your morning coffee. And in seven days, like me, you can become an inventory management pro. Both links are in the description. Enjoy. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Winning with Shopify podcast. For anyone that's not tuned in before, my name's Nick, and I believe this is the best Shopify podcast in the entire world. The reason I say that is our views are going up like crazy, our subscribers are going up like crazy, and the feedback we're getting from you guys is absolutely incredible. Not to mention our guests have been absolutely phenomenal in the information they share, the time they give up to come and record with us, and also answering some of your questions and follow-ups afterwards as well. If you're a brand that wants to grow and you're facing challenges, like all brands do, then come and join the Growth Hub at wwspodcast.com. The Growth Hub is an exclusive community just for Shopify brands. We have roundtable sessions, focus groups, feedback sessions, and ask an expert portal, and most importantly, the community itself. You can ask questions and see what other people are talking about. And you can also just follow other conversations and see what conclusions people come to in terms of how to run their business best. Today, I caught up with McCoy, who's the CMO of Portland Leather Goods. McCoy's an absolute legend, and he's been on the podcast before two years ago. Two years ago, he told us that they'd grown from 600,000 subscribers to 1.5 million subscribers on their email campaigns in just four months. So in this episode, we find out how much more have they grown and how is the business running overall. A couple of other topics that we do talk about, we talk about Etsy, women that are engaged, Shopify, startups, shipping, inefficiencies, lifetime value, email, multi-channel, limiting your own beliefs, CRO, the army, and management. So today is not to be missed. We covered a lot of ground in a very short space of time. So if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button, sit back and relax, and I hope you enjoy today's episode. McCoy, welcome back to the show. How are you? Nick, I'm doing fantastic. Thanks for having me back. I really appreciate it. Well, it's a pleasure to have you back. We've been desperate to get you back. I know you have a very busy schedule, um, but we're delighted to have you back with us today. Um, for anyone that missed your first episode, it was a couple of years ago. Naturally, we've picked up loads of new subscribers since then. And if you're not subscribed, hit the subscribe button, everybody. But tell us quickly, <laughs> McCoy, um, a little bit about the business you're part of and your role within uh, Portland Leather Goods as well. Perfect. Yeah. Well, I'm McCoy. I'm the CMO of Portland Leather Goods. Um, I joined Portland Leather Goods in March of 2018. Uh, Portland Leather Goods at the time was very much an Etsy company, very small. Uh, we focused on like your traditional Etsy crafts, so uh, obviously in the leather goods space. So this is like makeup bags and journals, and you could monogram your name on it. Um, that feels like a lifetime ago and a world away from where we are now. Um, we're now one of the largest bag and head of bag brands here in the United States. Um, and um, again, as I mentioned, my role is the CMO. I run the, all of the marketing teams and the advertising teams, and um, it's been a whirlwind. Like. I, I don't recognize the company today from where it was. We've gone through several rebirths of who we thought we were and where we thought we were going, uh, leading us to where we are now. We're on the cusp of some really exciting things. Uh, maybe we'll get into those today. Some of those are top secret, but well, I'll share as much as I possibly can. Good, good. And uh, yeah, I, I've asked um, McCoy for permission to mention some of the stats and he said yes to all of them so far. But as you said, there's always going to be top secret things and um, every business has its secret source. And if you share it, it's no longer secret source and you've got to find another one before you can pass this catch up. So completely understand. Um, but yeah, as I say, it's so good to have you back. Appreciate your introduction there as well. Um, you mentioned a lot of change. Now, I said to you before we hit record, we're not going to stick to the agenda at all. I'm going to leave the agenda behind for now. We'll come back to it in a minute. But you mentioned, and I don't think you mentioned this last time, actually, you guys actually started on Etsy. So that was the main place you guys were selling when, when you first joined the business, was it? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, we were we were doing about three and a half million on Etsy, which is not a small Etsy company by any means. Um, we, Kurt, Curtis touts the story. Curtis is our founder. Uh, he actually had to call Etsy headquarters in New York to get the advertising daily cap limit lifted for the entire platform. So he was spending, I think it was a, maybe a thousand dollars a day. And he called New York and said, I have to spend more. And they're like, no one spends more than a thousand dollars. This is Etsy. Like, well, excuse me, sir. What are you talking about? So we're one of the original reasons why Etsy actually lifted their advertising cap of a thousand dollars a day. They kind of shrugged their shoulders. and like, we don't actually, we don't actually know why we limit it there, but we'll, we'll lift <laughs> it for you. So yes, very much an Etsy company. How kind of them. Yeah. Yes. Generous. <laughs> 
<laughs> but I mean, it's interesting you started on Etsy then. So it was one of your first jobs when you came in the door then was like, hey, McCoy, we need a website or we've got a website. It's terrible. Like get going. And that was your first remit, was it? Or did you start on Etsy and then kind of branch out? Yeah. So I'm, I'm a recovering wedding photographer. Like I just, I, that was my life. And now I've left that behind. I'm so sick of, you know, running around for 12 hours a day, carrying tons of camera gear. Um, but when I started, my job was very like undefined, I should say. Um, I saw a crazy ad on Craigslist and decided to, you know, just walk in and try to join the team. I know. Yeah. So my original title <laughs> was digital media specialist. Um, so when I walked in the door that first day, they said, you know, hi, we're Fort Leather Goods. Uh, we have this Etsy company. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want anything to do with that. I know how to run ads because I run ads for my wedding photography business. So I can target engaged women. I know how to do that. I've used, you know, interest in demo targeting on Facebook. And uh, that led me to start to try to advertise their uh, makeup bags and toiletry bags for that. They were, we were advertising for uh, bridesmaids and groomsmen at the time. And I was like, I don't want nothing to do with Etsy. This little dot com thing, that, that's going to be my domain. So I very specifically didn't have an Etsy login, didn't know how to access the platform. And I spent all my time focusing <laughs> on the website. Yeah. Yeah. And that, I find it amazing because, I mean, so where, where my business is behind this wall spec, we get a lot of brands that come to us and it's not so much Etsy, we find it's more like, more Amazon. It's like we're doing so much on Amazon, we want to launch our own direct to consumer. Now, that comes with so many challenges, of course. Um, I'm going to share in a minute as well, just for everyone's benefit, some stats that McCoy shared with us a couple of years ago when he was on. And we're going to find out um, if he's received the WhatsApp message in time, um, what the stats now are as well. And that, that's part of the story as well, how connected or disconnected he's getting with some of the micro stuff. Um, but yeah, we, we, we've been through that challenge with, with so many different brands of trying to go, okay, we've got this marketplace platform doing everything for us. They take a massive commission. We have very little control. Obviously on Etsy, at least you're still sending your own products out. Whereas on Amazon, it's like, if we want to really harness Amazon, we've got to get, let them do that. That's more cost as well, but we offer an amazing service. But then if another company comes along and Amazon likes them more than us, we're bankrupt. We've lost everything. So what were some of those early challenges of getting that first? I assume Shopify um, was the platform. You know, was it a platform before that? What were some of those early challenges you guys started with? Man, that's a great question. Um, yeah, as, as I mentioned, so we had this Etsy company and that was doing about three and a half million. The website, um, it, it existed. There was kind of like a shell and a frame that, that I had to play with. Um, we were doing somewhere in the neighborhood of like six to $800 a day on that website. So um, Shopify was very much like the, the little side project no one cared about. All of the company internally was focused on Etsy.com. Um, and from there, like the way we, we just, we focused on getting, especially me, like the team at the time was Curtis, who I shared a desk with, like with our founder. Um, and we had one other graphic designer um, who was titled creative designer named Erica. And every day I just would come in and try to focus on just getting a little bit better. And that, I'll phrase it this way. Um, when you're in the startup phase, you, you care so much about, you value motion because nothing exists. So the most valuable thing that happens to you usually on a given day is not what eventually you'll care about, you know, optimizations and, and trying to uh, get a little bit more out of men every day. You care about somebody showing up in the door and making something, just making anything because nothing exists. So it's your primary metric for success. You know, somebody shows up and they had an idea and they did it. And now something exists in the corner and you can kind of use it as a tool. Um, and then eventually at some point, the business transitioned where it's large enough to where you, your primary value being motion or somebody willing to show up and do something, you value the accuracy of that motion or the calibration of that motion to really hone in on what's most important at that time. Because uh, eventually you get to a point where the business has more to lose with reckless motion than it does to gain. But in the beginning, that's not true. You just need things to exist. So I, when I think back to those early days, I mean, problems were infinite, right? There was no shortage of like, what can I do today to make the business better? I remember one like really famous example was I, I'm starting to hunt down optimizations on the website and I look for, um, I start, again, I know nothing about Shopify at the time. I was a wedding photographer. So I start hunting down all the different stats in the dashboard and just try to find something that I can lock in on and say, okay, this is not good and I'm going to make it better. And one of the things at the time was we had an incredibly high spread between the number of people who reached checkout and the people who actually converted. And again, I'm very new and I'm like, okay, I don't know what that means, but I would like more people to convert. So let me attack that particular like subject. What's happening between when you reach checkout to when you actually make the purchase. And the thing I noticed was we had no concept whatsoever because we were on Etsy and shipping was much more simple to handle um, than trying to create custom rules or understand our volumetric weight and things like that, where our shipping prices on Shopify were 
very, 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 very high. We didn't have any negotiated rates with any carriers. We hadn't even you know, attempted that relationship. Um, and we were charging people 20 and $25 to ship a bag. Now, that's what we thought it cost. We just didn't know better. Um, and I remember going to the shipping team and I said, hey, this seems, this seems really crazy. Like, I, I, I don't think we're going to be able to scale this thing if we have to charge somebody $25 to ship them a small bag. You know, this is Amazon. They're used to free shipping. And uh, I said, I believe we're losing, and this was the quote, thousands of dollars per day. And I quite literally got laughed at because we were a small company. We didn't know. And they said, you think thousands of dollars? Really? We're losing thousands of dollars per day? And I was like, yeah, but that was the scale of our mind at the time. You know, we were doing $800 a day. And here I was saying, I think we're losing thousands. And that was just multiple times our daily revenue. There's no way that could possibly be true. Um, so I think about stuff like that. It's, it's this hunt and kill of inefficiency mode when you're in that startup phase to just make everything a little bit better every single day. And it's a little careless. It's a little reckless. And that's kind of what you want is somebody hunting down the lowest hanging fruit and just seeing if they can get you to a little bit higher the next day and a little bit higher the next day. And if you do that for 30 days in a row, you'll be shocked at how much further you, were, you are ahead now than when you started. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, someone said to me the other day that to walk a thousand kilometers, you've got to take, was it a hundred thousand steps? <laughs> so I'm in the like, United States, oh, the yeah. kilometers blows my mind. Sense. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it sounds right but, to me. Uh, yeah, exactly. And it's probably not those exact numbers. So don't go out walking now and come back to me in a year's time and say, I've done a hundred thousand kilometers. It wasn't, it was more steps than that, but you get the idea. It's one step at a time equals a long distance. Um, I, I love that you focus on those things. And sometimes I think Sometimes some things can seem so obviously wrong or obviously the wrong thing to look at until you start making a difference. And I take it that that, that, that particular story has the conclusion that like, yeah, yeah, we lowered the shipping costs and suddenly more people were buying stuff. You, you nailed it. Yeah, it really it's one of the great like tragedies of business advice where it always sounds so simple. And if you do enough of those simple, like, you hear simple things like that, like, hey, it's probably a good idea to lower our shipping price. And it sounds too simple. And so it's not usually where people go out and they like focus their action because they're looking for the big hack or the big next thing. But the, I mean, the real tragedy is like, that's the truth. If you do enough simple, small wins and you stack them over time, like that is how you get ahead. So you're exactly right. You lower shipping price, guess what happens? Conversion rate goes up. Guess what happens? More money hits the bank account. So you're, I didn't put a bow on that story. So thank you for wrapping that up for me. <laughs> correct. No, it's good. I mean, we, we did a test um, with a client that we, I've only got the data back on it um, today. They've increased their guarantee on the products. So if product goes wrong, you can bring it back. It's currently two years and they've done an AB test of making it five years. And they were like, surely it's gonna have no impact. And I was like, okay, but no impact is still a good learning. The customers don't care. And they've come back and they have 5% more sales when they do it. So there's a 5% uplift in total revenue. So not, unfortunately, not a 5% conversion rate uplift. That would be nice conversion rate, but it was still like 0.3%. I said, look, we find 10 of these things. We've over doubled our conversion rate. E everyone clear. Yeah, we've done one. We need nine more now. Let's go. And that could be changing the color of the button or something. Um, let's, I, I could talk about the early days all day, but I want to get onto some of these juicy numbers that we got last time. So let's fast forward. I mean, a long, long time uh, for you. And certainly in this day and age where people are moving every two or three years in their roles, Let's fast forward to two years ago when you came on, you had 600,000 subscribers. And then the day we spoke to you was four months after that and you had 1.5 million subscribers. Um, and that's email subscribers, receiving emails from you guys. It's a big part of your lifetime value. Anyone listening to that is like, oh my gosh, how? You used retention.com and a whole series of very complicated marketing tactics as well. It wasn't as simple as just turning it on and bang, we're making more money. Tell us a little bit about the strategy to get from 600K to 1.5 million. And then where are you today, two years on from that as well? Yeah. Uh, I mean, we, we mentioned it last time, like um, obviously we, we were introduced to the podcast by retention.com and that, that was a software we were just starting to use. And that's been incredibly successful for us. Um, there's been a definitely like a, an art to it, I should say. As with anything, like, I mean, marketing is the art of being gentle and subtle, like not holding a gun to somebody's head and, and asking them to buy. Right. And so from where we were, like, I remember the first time we heard about, you know, technologies like retention.com and this was early in our, our marketing team today, like um, up, up until very recently, it was just myself and uh, my colleague, Matt. So it was a very, 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 and we were at the nine figure scale when that we were hitting just two people. So it's been a very small, as far as like the actual paid media and advertising um, and email and SMS strategy. Um, I remember when we first heard about technologies like retention.com and the technology was exciting, but what excited Matt and I the most about is like what we could do with that extra scale of volume inside of our accounts. Like we understand. And so there's, 
a finesse to it, which is like, okay, more email does not equal more revenue. It does not. Like, it's plenty possible to degrade your the quality of your email list. Um, it's plenty possible to degrade the quality of your segmentation to really mess up and uh, not nurture correct flows and to not do the proper uh, optimizations and A-B testing on that. Um, but from what you mentioned, we, we started with 600K at the time, um, at the point of reference which in which we talked last, and then we were ending at about 1.5 million. Uh, I am not going to, we'll edit in or I'll tell you later the exact number because I don't want to misspeak uh, on the actual date and where we are now because I'm waiting for a, this to load here on my corner screen to tell you the exact number of, number of email subscribers, but I will share that with you. Um, but it's, I mean, it's exploded to, to put it lightly. We're finishing out our second year over the nine figure scale. So we're now officially stabilized over the $100 million mark, which we're very excited about. Um, but email in general, uh, again, I'm, I'm mostly focused on the meta and the paid ad side. Um, email is by far the domain of my colleague, Matt. But uh, I'll just say that we have adjusted how we look at email, how we look at SMS, and how we look at like the customer journey since then in a completely new light. And I think that we're maturing as the brand hits new, larger, and larger scales. And it's similar to the, the point I just mentioned before, where you start with motion and then you slowly work into a calibration and accuracy of that motion. And I think that that's the phase that we're currently into is really getting specific and calibrated with our motion as it relates to ads, emails, SMS, segmentation, intro, you know, really putting people where they belong and not just trying to hammer a whole list like we used to do in the days, days of MailChimp, where it's like one email to the whole list, go, go, go. In two years, we went from 1.5 million. We're now at 4.6 million active profiles on our Klaviyo account. So massive, massive growth. The growth hasn't slowed down. It's only accelerated over the past few years. And um, I mean, for, I mean we, we, we didn't imagine we would get to there this quick. We thought it would take many, many more years than where we're sitting at yeah. today to get to that uh, total scale. I think it's amazing that the way you talk about that, actually, the, the way you think about email. And I, I think email itself has changed as well. The way customers perceive it, the way they receive emails, the way spam filters work. Um, if, if anyone's listening and, and hasn't signed up yet, definitely get involved in our community, uh, the William Shopify Growth Hub, it's called. Um, we had a round table only a few days ago. In fact, two days before we, I, I'm filming this with McCoy right now. Um, Two days ago, we had a round table about email. And one of the biggest things we were discussing actually is how Microsoft currently is giving really bad spam scores to lots and lots of people on email. Um, and we discussed actually how to come around that. And someone has gone as far as changing the IP address that emails are sent from They're using a new email platform. And they're now even sending, changing the actual name within the email account that is sending the emails out. But even that's going to start with like email 0.1% of your audience, then email 1%, then email 2%, then email 5%, then 10%. So slowly ramp your way up. And I think... Email has changed so much, as you say, McCoy, from the days where we used to just blast something out. I think the only time we blast anything out these days is when there's such a big announcement. But even then, you send at least four versions of it to go like, which one of the four was the most, um, you know, the most punchy? Or do we change the language slightly to any segmentations that we are aware of in our email database? But I guess to ask a question is a bit more, as you say, kind of in your field as opposed to uh, what Matt's doing. And, and Matt's great, by the way. We did have him on the other episode a couple of weeks ago. He was fantastic um, in talking about some of this. But your field then of Google Ads and Meta Ads, how do, you, how do you and Matt work together or get those two um, mechanisms of advertising and email to work together? Like, is it one brings the customer in and then almost like a completely second thing kicks in called email? Or um, do you guys actually manage to sync some of that up together? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, as I mentioned, like we're, we're in the process of really trying to mature in the way that we handle the, let's say, the generation of revenue. So the first thing that we do, and that's how I'm going to attack this problem. It's like, okay, we as a business need to generate revenue, and we're going to do it through the activities of one acquisition and two retention. Where that, that's how we conceptualize it too. Um, Matt is our director of marketing, and now inside of his team, he has somebody who is focused on media buying, which is shorthand for acquisition, and he has somebody in the retention marketing space. Um, so for us, when it comes to, so I, I only make that point of clarification, whereas email is a, is a piece of the retention effort, but it, it also shares activities inside of the acquisition department. But for us, and just for all intents and purposes, we, we tend to conceptualize that as much more involved in the retention side of things than per se the acquisition, although that certainly is happening. It's just not dependable, uh, as dependable of a platform to like, if you're going to predict future revenue or revenue for the next 30 days to depend on email necessarily to bring that in. Um, so in any case, we, we look at these two activities, which is acquisition and retention. When it comes to acquisition, there is no better platform on earth than Meta. Like that's just the way in the world we live in and we're no different. Um, when it comes to Google, we've, we've kind of adjusted our uh, perspective on Google. Google 
also is one of the things that Matt runs very, very well for our business. It's one of the reasons he got brought on the team because I had no idea. Again, I was a wedding photographer six years ago. So I figured out meta ads and I'm like, we had no Google ads running. I'm like, I don't know how to do it. Like, let's hire this guy. He knows how to do it. And Matt has been phenomenal. Um, But when it comes to acquisition, right, um, we focus now as a business. And um, these are obviously hotly debated topics online. I'm not interested in debating it. I like to frame things through the lens of like, this is what Portland Weather Goods does, and this is how we steer the business. Um, and there's a lot of reasons that we act in a specific way, I'm sure, with anyone. There's a lot of extra conditions that everyone, every business has to juggle that are not going to appear, you know, like on the hottest Twitter thread on how best to run your med account. But in any case, um, we're moving to a, a much more mature way, and again, in my perspective, of how we handle the, the pass off between acquisition and retention. And so the biggest, one of the larger things that we focus on is the cost reduction of returning customer revenue. Now, what that means for us is to not not retarget, not not, there we go, not not retarget using platforms like Google and Meta. We're certainly involved in those activities, but to lean much more heavily on things like email and SMS and really carefully curated segmentation and flows and optimization of all of those things so that we can bring in the, well, and also, and there's a whole extra side of this, so we can tackle that else after this, but um, on those, using those things, emails and segmentation and flows to put people where they belong inside of the returning customer segment so that we can get the most amount of revenue for the lowest possible cost. And it's really easy for your returning customer revenue cost to run away from you if you're involved in not segmenting or limiting your retargeting on platforms like Meta. So email is the primary mechanism from which we we tend to facilitate retention, but there's a whole other business strategy side that we we really take into account when it comes to retention. But that, that may be a conversation for another day. I'll leave it there as far as it relates to email. No, no, I love it. And you mentioned about um yeah about about Matt knowing lots about Google Ads. I've been running Google Ads for 17 years, and I can vouch you meet that some crazy people that know about Google Ads, and we are a very weird and rare breed, I'm afraid. Um, and we some of us are difficult to work with. I'll say that as well. Like we think Google is the only thing, and it's the best thing. But Matt's great, and I think that integrated strategy you guys have got is, is really really powerful. Um, we've certainly had we've had endless debates with clients about how much we spend on like brand on Google, for example, knowing full well they're coming to us anyway. And it's more an assessment of like, if, if we know someone's going to convert, we don't mind paying a tiny bit just at the final point of conversion to stop them going to a reseller of our products or a competitor's advertising on us. And um, even then, I, I I was on a call only three, four weeks ago with one of my clients and their three biggest competitors. I managed to get all of them on a call together and say, can we all agree to a truce? We had all each other's names as a negative, you know, account wide. And they all said yes. So I said, right, I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to show you I'm doing it on my client right now. And you all need to follow along. And we all did it. Um, and, and like the um, the actual budget we're spending on Google now is means we've all added our own brands as a negative as well. So if you search any of those four main brands, none of our ads show, not even on our own name, which means we're all getting it organically. Everyone's slightly more profitable. Um, and the clients now said, like, can we just keep an eye on this? Because at some point, someone's going to crack and go, do you know what? I'm putting them all in. Yeah. They'll hire a new a Google agency who will change it. Um, but I, I do think, yeah, I mean, brand is one way of doing it. Audience exclusions. There's quite a few ways to do it. And I think you guys are very, very smart to do that. And I think when brands are smaller, you don't need to worry so much because every almost every order is a new order anyway, because you're still trying to get your name out there. But there's definitely a point where that needs to change. And as you say, what you don't want to do is be paying Google or Meta like $40 per, per time every, a customer comes in and purchases from you. That's a terrible thing when you can send an email to, you know, a thousand of them for like $1. And it's, it's, it's such a better, better cost model. And so I completely agree with that. Does your email marketing suck? Do you wish it converted better and integrated better with your store? Well, there is a solution. We've partnered with Seguno, who are an email platform that is built into Shopify, which means you don't have to leave Shopify to go and manage your email campaigns. So you can run your marketing at the same place you run your shop. To learn more, you can claim your free customer analysis and strategy session and visit seguno.com forward slash winning with Shopify. That's S-E-G-U-N-O dot com forward slash winning with Shopify. Seguno is made for merchants, not marketers. I mean, how do you guys report internally, I guess, is one of the questions that I remember from our last conversation. I, I loved what you said about attribution. How do you report in it? Like, how does Matt get credit for what's going on on Google? What's happening within the email? How you get reported back on Meta ads? Anyone else working on this? 
Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, like, so external attribution hardly exists. So the truth is internal attribution hardly exists, right? So we, we're a blended team. And so we're all, you know, working together in tandem to make sense of all of this thing. Um, we, you, you, we, just to touch off your previous point, you know, the, it's not to say that we're, we're not involved in the retargeting, but one of the anecdotes I hear a lot, um, and especially you're going to hear from your meta rep is like, costs are always rising. Costs are always rising. And I always say like, no, like there has to be some sort of limiting factor to what, right? To thousands of dollars per new customer. Like that can't be true. So one of the things that I find that is a problem inside of the industry or just inside of like marketing and, and acquisition retention in general is when people say, okay, the cost of new customers are rising. Usually I say, okay, well, how do you, how are you finding out the cost of your new customer? And this is again, one of the internal conversations we're having between these two teams. Now, our main focus is that they're not warring against each other. They're working together to create the best mix for the business. So internal attribution is just basically like, hey, good job, hey, good job. Like let's let's monitor this the best we can. We use information tools like Triple Whale. We're not we're not on Northbeam or anything like that. We've used Triple Whale. It's pretty much exclusively. It's worked great for us. Um, but to the point of the the rising cost of new customers, I'll usually ask people like, how are you calculating that? Because if you're spending advertising dollars that you are not sure are absolutely segmented towards the action of new customer acquisition, then you don't actually know your new customer acquisition cost. What I tend to find people do is take the total blended ad spend, and maybe there's a few subtractions, like they, they subtract out, let's say like a SMS fee that they know they're sending to a returning customer where the segmentation is exactly clear, but they're looking at this total pool of ad spend and then saying, oh my gosh, my, my new customer acquisition cost is rising because they're just dividing the ad spend against their total uh, you know, number of new customers that month, that week, that year, whatever it is. Um, and so for us, again, we, especially as it relates to platforms like Google, Meta, it's a little bit more simple to, you know, add inclusion and exclusion criteria. And it, there's still leakage as with anything, especially with um, new formats like ASC, which we're not massively a fan of. But in any case, if we can't cost segment and really point back internally and say, this is how much dollars we're spending on the activity of acquisition, and this is the amount of dollars we're spending on the activity of uh, retention, then we find that like, we don't actually know our NCPA for that month. We need to really hone in on it and then make sense of it. Um, and to put a, or to wrap that up, it's basically like our goal is to create a stabilized revenue generation engine for the business. And one that is stabilized doesn't mean one that's not changing. It means one that we can understand to the best of our ability. So if it goes up because trend lines go up sometimes that we understand why and how and when and all of the factors surrounding it. And when it goes down that we understand conversely just the same factors. So in any case, it, internally, we're working together every single day, still with that same like scrappy mindset, like let's make small incremental changes there. It, it looks less like, hey, let's build this giant new you know product line or division of the company. It's much more like, hey, let's optimize these email flows. Let's optimize these advertising flows. Let's make sure that they match you know the, the same message together and so that they're more cohesive. And so the journey between their first, what they buy on their first purchase and what they buy on their third purchase makes sense to us. But internally, again, it's very cohesive as opposed to, let's say, if you had two agencies and they were both competing for the same pool of revenue and trying to take attribution to prove their worth to you. So yeah, yeah, yeah. we're a fully internal yeah. team. Yeah, yeah. And we, we've, we've been there with that attribution model. And we've got we've got a couple of clients where um, they run some things internally and some things externally with us. And they've got like one of them has just bought Triple Way in and we look fantastic and the internal team look awful. And fortunately, it was that way around, because I think if we were the ones that looked terrible, if we got the lower attribution than they did, it would be fired. And it's, it is hilarious. It's the same situation um, either way. It's just how the internal politics just, just work. It's just the nature of humans, I think, internal, external. But one of the things I absolutely love, and you came back to it anyway, I was going to come back to the, the kind of, if you make a creative change on the website, those micro things of let's change the color of the button or let's put a statement next to the title of this product, just saying like, um, you know, we believe this is, we're, we're happy to be proven wrong, but this is the best product in the United States of America right now. For the, you know, this is the best leather bag you can buy in the US. Um, and we're happy to be proven wrong. You put something like that in, suddenly your conversion rates go up. And sometimes you find all the marketing guys are like, oh, yes, haven't we done well this month? And as you say, if you don't know what things have changed and when they changed, to, sometimes it is just, I think, just looking at the bottom line and just going like, right, conversion half to that day or doubled that day. What did we change? And we need to keep a log of that. And better still, if you're A-B testing, so you can go version B of the site and A, oh, only one of them's gone up when it's clearly whatever we're testing or actually they've both gone up. So it was nothing to do with the test we're running. It was something else. 
and you can quite quickly drill down and find it. Because um, the most important thing is if you know the things that have really turned your customers on to want to convert, you do more of them. It's nice and simple. But I do find, um, I don't know how much you guys do on A-B testing, but I find some brands, are, they, they, I'm really, I'm struggling with it a little bit, I'll be honest, and say on the podcast in front of thousands of people. Um, I do struggle with it a little bit sometimes. And I'm like, we should A-B test this. And the client's like, well, it's obviously better, just roll it out. And I'm like, but I don't know how much better it was. Like, We've done 10 things and we've improved, but we don't know which of the 10 was the most important or what impact each of the 10 had to then actually just rebalance our content and go, people really care about dimensions on this product or the weight or especially for a bag. How heavy is it? It's made of real leather. Leather sounds heavy. You know, how heavy yeah. is it? It's probably an important thing, but you might find it's the third most important thing. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we are, I mean, to answer your question, we are A-B testing like you would not believe. Um, we... It was always been a focus, even when we were small to like, we, we hired a uh, kind of a boutique freelance uh, web developer and she was fantastic. Um, and one of the things she introduced us to, and this is back in 2019. So it's just about, you know, again, I, re, again, to rephrase, re, re say this, I knew nothing walking in. So she introduced us to the idea of AV testing. I'm like, what is that? That sounds really interesting because I'm on here making changes all the time. And to the point, like, I think they're good. <laughs> I've certainly made mistakes. I've certainly made things that I thought were good and, and actually turned the out to be bad. going up. Yeah. Yeah. Like it looks <laughs> good, right? You know, like, well, who knows? Um, but she introduced us to the concept of A-B testing. And since then, like, I personally have been like a, just mad as it comes to CRO and A-B testing and really focusing on all of those things on the website. Because to your point, right, there is when you, uh, and this is something I say constantly about advertising, because again, the, the mass volume of conversation around advertising is it's just as it's planet sized compared to the amount of conversation we're having around general business optimizations as advertisers. There's plenty of people talking about it in their own space, but as advertisers, we're not talking about that sometimes. And so to the point is like, you can go make the best ad and you can write the best copy and you can put that in one campaign and one ad set as of one single ad. And it by itself might do good. And maybe it's enough, you know, momentum to lift, you know, rise the waters and lift all boats in your that ad set or maybe that campaign if you're lucky, but it's pretty unlikely it's going to do anything on the whole account level, right? Conversely, if you make a good business decision, now that can, I phrase it that way because it can be a new product, it can be you know a difference in the way that we're approaching brand, it can be a CRO decision. You make one of those, you can lift the relative performance of all of your creatives, all of your ad sets, all of your campaigns, all of your whole account, and all of your channels all at the same time. And so I focus a lot of my activity, again, as the CMO, is we have an advertising team, we have an acquisition team, we have a uh, retention team. I focus a lot of my activity on that side of it, which is like, how can I remove obstacles to raise the water level so that these guys have more room to run? Because you can't do that through the activity of advertising or even sometimes through the activity of retention, stopping you know bad decisions from coming to fruition or making really good decisions that you know will align with advertising retention yeah. activities. And I think it's such a beautiful way to look at it. Um, I, I love the fact that you look at how can I support everybody. And we, we used to we used to joke years ago in, in my agency, like we're talking 10, 12 years ago, it's like, oh, some of these clients, it's just so hard to sell this product. It's so dry and boring. And these ones, oh, it's so fun. And I think now I've matured a little bit and looking back at those and also looking at my client list now, all clients have good products that we can sell. We just need to find the way to sell them and the way to market, the way to position them, what the real value add is to the customer. And that's the thing that makes the difference. Um, and I, I think certainly some clients, like we we certainly talk to them and say like, have you guys got anything? And they're like, well, it's International Men's Day today. And they're like, you, just, you can't just pick something at random. Like, what is it that makes your customers want to convert? You know, where's the customer feedback survey? Where's the Microsoft Clarity data to tell us that, um, you know, when we moved this on the page or you know, we had a client recently and we were looking at the Microsoft Clarity and everyone was getting halfway down the product page. And just below the bit they stopped at and went back to the top was the buy, the buy one, get one free offer. And we were like, put that at the top of the page, make that the first thing we did. Conversion almost doubled. Like it was just shy of doubling. And it was like such simple things. And I think you're absolutely right that you make a, a change to product or something and lifts all of the water. It's so much better for everybody. And But what you've just described, and I'm going to transition this into the final thing I really want to talk about, because I think you have some really good perspective on this. Um, you, you've let go of control from the days where you came in, you know, wedding photography just behind you. Um, and I love that you did that. I've been to so many weddings. I used to DJ at weddings, which I think I said a few weeks ago, one of the episodes, like 
weddings are great for a season <laughs> and then it's like oh now we're doing this bit now it's a long day and i hit and it's weekends as well a lot of the time so you just come out of that and you were doing everything you'd free reign you know the, the website is mccoy's baby and mccoy can do whatever he wants on the website you now have a team of people and you've obviously released the, your team possibly agencies other suppliers to do stuff a lot of people listening will be like i want to control everything forever and if they do that there's only so much that can happen and it's based on the capacity of one person how did you get to where you are today? How do you release control? And I guess a caveat question with that as well is, and I, I'm assuming this is one of the most important things you've done, if it's similar to me, is how do you empower people to own stuff, to really put their heart and soul into it, but also to know like what good looks like? Yeah, that, I mean, that's a great question. That's really one of like the fundamental questions that I that businesses need to answer if they are to scale. Like going from the, the, you know, the small bootstrappy startup phase into the much larger business phase, like you get to a point where you can't possibly do all of the work yourself. Um, and so, you know, one of the things we talk about, and I have a fantastic team. Um, one of the things we talk about with our, my directors, um, who are the heads of each of my individual clusters of activities. So I have a graphic design with social media, e-commerce, advertising, and uh, software development now, which I'm really excited about that department as well. Um, one of the things we talk about is like limiting beliefs. And the limiting belief is like, oh, I don't have the permission to change that. I don't have that permission to like manipulate that, which I, it, it, we all have those. And, you know, on one hand, it's very reasonable, which is like somebody comes in your business and they're talented, but they, there's things that they will do. And there's things that they won't do based on the permissions they think that they have available to them. And so for me, it's trying really hard to work with the directors to lift their limiting beliefs and be like, you can change that. You know how to change that. I don't need to be involved in that decision. But to answer, I mean, the answer the question more broadly is like, okay, how do we give up control? Um, you have to build and you have to develop people. So what, what needs to happen in Portland Leather Goods today is more work than I could ever possibly do by myself. And so when I shift the perspective from, I want to do everything, I want to be in control. And in a way, when you're sitting a t you know higher on the organization chart, you have to understand that you, you are in, still in control, but the way that you're getting that work done is through somebody else. So you, you have to recruit amazing talent. And then you have to teach them what the metrics to success are. And then you have to like nurture their skills and you have to observe and you have to measure and you have to realign. Um, and so one of my favorite quotes, and this, I try to use this in my leadership a lot, which is the difference between a laser that can cut through steel and the street light is not the output of the bulb. They have relatively similar voltages or output. It's the area in which that light is concentrated at. And so for me, it's running back and forth between five directors and uh, we got a bunch of new exciting things that we're working on and I'm working with those team leaders too, running back and forth and trying to focus like a mirror, all of their effort in the exact same place. And you would be surprised. You don't, you probably don't even need to do much more than you're doing today. You probably have way more misalignment problems than you might believe. And so for us, the key to scaling has always been removing the obstacle to what's next. We are very fortunate because we have a fantastic product and I have had to try for a, a, a very small number of months to actually honestly generate demand for our product. We have almost always been in exclusively um, the mode of how do we re remove limits in production so that we get more products to sell. But demand has been really easy for us. Um, so going from, as you mentioned, being the person um, to now my team, I think on the marketing team specifically is about 24 people inside of those different departments. Uh, we have agencies, very little. We tend to you know, keep things close to the chest for that sake of alignment to make sure that we're all, again, firing at the same direction. It's harder when you have a lot of agencies, especially if they're warring with each other. Um, but it's running around and it's, it's getting people aligned. And you, again, the metric of success for me is like, I know I can't do this work. So the way I approach problems is not, or with any new, new thing I need to tackle, it's like, how do I accomplish X? The method for me is pretty simple. I'm going to go find somebody who knows how to do it very, very well. I'm going to bring them into my team. I'm going to put them under some great leaders. And then I'm going to line them at the target that I need to shoot them at. It's not, it's no longer about, you know, McCoy or Matt or any of these, you know, individual people um, focusing on the problem themselves and trying to just put their nose down and grind it. It's get great talent, assemble a team and align them at the goal that you actually want to you know, shoot at. And so it, it's got, it's, it's come a long way for in the past few years, especially in the past two years where we really built out our proper middle management suite, which is our director level. And um, I'm, I'm excited about all the new challenges we're about to tackle in the upcoming year. So 
I think, I mean, it's such a good answer. And the, the thing you reminded me of when you said about the finding someone and going, I know I can't do this, let's get someone in who can. Um, it reminds me of, a, I was reading a book by an old um, military general, a, a British military general. And he said that one of the big things when they launched the SAS in, during the war, uh, during the World War, was that he, they actually said like, we, we're going to stop telling our soldiers like, do this, then this, then this, then this. They just said, in that compound over there are five of our soldiers and they're currently being taken hostage. Go and get them back and tell us what you need. And they'd go, right, I need a helicopter, a tank, and or actually we just need a load of camouflage gear and give us two, give us a week and we'll monitor it for six days and we'll go in on the seventh day. Just That's what we're going to do. And they went, all right, that achieves my goal. And I think you're absolutely right. And I, I've certainly had it before and I've, I've you know, hired quite a few people, got a whole team of them behind us here. And one of the biggest challenges I found with, with hiring, um, when you said like hiring great talent and finding the right people, I've definitely learned and seen people that haven't worked out here and gone somewhere and been really successful. I've learned it's never like, it's never the wrong person, it's the right person for us. And that's, I think that's a really key distinction of, and sometimes it is just yourself. You go, who works well with McCoy? What, what are the personalities here? Do I like and what do I not like? Therefore, what do I need to do in my interview process to, to weed out the ones that it won't work for them here because I'm going to be a problem to them as much as they're going to be a problem to me. But I think giving people that goal and saying, look, look, guys, this statistic here, this it's not high enough. And I'm tasking you three with improving it. So firstly, I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you 24 hours. Come back to me and tell me what's wrong with it and tell me what you need. What do you need from me to make that better? And if you think it's the wrong statistic or it's not going to achieve the total company goal that you're, as you say, you're also aware of, everyone knows where we're trying to go with this thing, then come back and tell me that we're focusing on the wrong thing. And now these people, they're empowered. They're like, we can, and it's almost exciting and you can get creative and all that stuff we spoke about earlier about changing the website, running AV tests, it all starts with create creative hypotheses. So if you guys say, actually, our return rates are way too high, too many customers are sending products back. I'm tasking you or you guys with with fixing that. Go and find out what we need to know and say, do you know what? The number one return reason is this. And we found that from the customer service team or talking to customers that return stuff. So we're just going to change the web copy to say this and we'll see what happens. And it's like, fantastic. That's a great output. But if you said to them, talk to customers, then do this and just, they would miss opportunities in that process. They'd come out and go, actually, what you were saying, McCoy, was not what we need to do to fix the problem at all. The problem's right. Or actually the problem's slightly bigger or smaller or different to what you think it is. This is the solution we think we need to go after. And if it doesn't work, we'll find another one. And it's, it's yeah, a much more sure. creative way of working like that empowerment. I, I usually, yeah, like you, can, you can kind of evaluate that through like the... Uh, I, I call it the how versus the what, right? So when you, like, for instance, you give somebody that top level task, which is just like, I want you to, for in the, in the military example, go rescue those hostages. Or for us, let's say like, let's start at the, the largest goal that the marketing team is tasked with, which is just to say, make me a, give me a hundred million dollars worth of revenue at the door. And then I go, okay, sounds good. Like, and then I break that down into what needs to happen to do that. But I find when you're working with, a, whether it's a leader or you're, it's an individual contributor on a team, if you start hearing questions like, how, or excuse me, or what do you want me to do? I, I butchered that. So it's to say, what, what do you want me to do? I want you to generate $100 million worth of revenue for the business. If you start getting a lot of like, how do I do that questions? Well, how do I do that? How do I do that? And then you find yourself in the incrementalism of like, step one, you know, turn on your computer. Step two, load up Facebook. Step three, find something clever to sell, right? If you find that you're, you're constantly answering like, how do I do that questions with your team? Um, it's a good it's a good point of reflection and it's not always on them. Sometimes it's on you as the leader. One, you might not have the right people in the right seat. Two, you might not have grown and nurtured them in advance of where they need to be at the point where you come to a new inflection point and it's time to change our objectives. Um, or three, like you just haven't built the correct system, right? So it's, it's, you know, you shouldn't expect everyone to come into your business and at every level at an individual contributor level, all the way to your executives to be entrepreneurial geniuses. There is some work on behalf of the leadership team, whether that's you all the way up to the executive team to like build a system that makes sense, that makes success likely as opposed to, you know, breaking down and you get everyone because I'm guilty. I do the same thing too. I, I'm an executive and I still end up having to go, how do I do this? And that's not a comfortable position for anyone to operate in. You much, you're much better off when you can give direction or you can set goals and you have the correct structure and team where you say, they say, just what do you want me to do? Oh, you can, you want me to generate hundred million dollars worth of revenue? I know how to do that. I know how to break that into the millions and millions of micro actions of sending emails and running ads and making sure the website looks good and making sure that everything is hitting, you know, the inventory at the correct time in order to make that happen. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I, I love what you say actually about the, if you suddenly find yourself going, how do I do this? 
I, I guess what I mean, one thing we do ask people in interviews now, and we don't ask them this, but we we ask a set of questions where we want to hear the answer. I would work it out. I'd go on Google and I'd search stuff and I would work it out because that's part of the empowerment. I think what, what you don't want is someone coming back going, here is the bulletproof plan to make a hundred million dollars, but I don't know how to do any of it. <laughs> it's like, well, there's a pointless plan, isn't it? Like, okay, how do we get to the, how do we get to the first dollar? And then we'll work on 10, then a hundred, then a thousand, you know, you can always sort of break or say to people, can you break it down then into those little steps and we'll see where we get to, but it goes back to what you were saying earlier about limiting beliefs. Uh, I think about making sure everyone believes like we can actually achieve anything here. We just need to set out and get on with it and actually start making some, making some mistakes. You know, we will learn from those mistakes as we go. Yeah. But an important, an important form frame of reference for us is like, we, we went through a season where we were doubling and doubling revenue every year. And so like, if we, if we today look at our goals for two years from now and we say, okay, like we want to be at X amount of revenue. And then you start to imagine that company in your head that what, what is it going to take to get to this point? And as far as you can stretch your imagination to the future, the more beneficial it'll be for you, especially as a leader. But not only that, as, as, a, as a worker, as a professional trying you know, to move up in your career. And if you look ahead and you're like, let's say there's a huge inflection point in the next two years where you're like, I am, I'm doing, currently doing $10 million in my business and I want to do $100 million in revenue. And this is the title or this is a position or the responsibility I hold. Could I go today interview for the same position at a $100 million company? And if the answer is no... I don't think that I'm qualified, then you have, ex- you've measured your runway and you get to work at that figurative person being that figurative person every single day until you hit that point. And the key is to just constantly be setting these goals in the future so that one day, you, worst thing, worse yet would be is if you don't grow and we're, you know, collectively as individuals and as leaders, the reason why the company can't grow, because we're not the people who have the skills and the ability to make it grow. And that's a real tragedy. So I'm constantly trying to think in advance and go like, okay, if we're going to hit this amount of revenue, and let's say that we want our company to be worth this relative, you know, speculative valuation amount, what does a CMO of that company look like? Am I that person today? And the answer is no. And so every day I'm trying to grow myself and grow my team and grow the people who work for us into those people so that one, the opportunity doesn't pass me or them by, but worse yet that I'm not the reason or the catalyst that we're holding the company back because we don't actually have the skills to go where we're going. So I use that frame of reference quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. And I absolutely love that. And I think certainly looking back at our growth as a business, I used to sit there and go like, oh, I'm, I'm going to make an agency of like a thousand people. Let's go for it. And I had that realization about seven or eight years ago. I sat there and went, a thousand staff. What a nightmare. <laughs> what an absolute <laughs> catastrophe. I'm not looking after all of those guys. And, and it, but, but then it was like, okay, if I had 10 people, what would I need to do? Right. Well, let's get to 10 first. And I need to actually learn a lot, change a lot, do a lot. And I, I think it's a really important path as well. And certainly in e-commerce, and I, I probably mentioned this before for people that listen all the time, but I used to run a bamboo sunglasses business on Shopify. And one of the reasons I shut that down is I did my sums and said, okay, for me to take 50,000 pounds or dollars in a single year from this business, how many units per day do we need to sell on our current model? And what changes can we make to get there? And it was crazy the amount of work I would need to do. And I thought, and what do I need to do to make 50,000 pounds more in my agency? Two or three new clients? Right. Let's go and get two or three new clients. It was, it was that kind of, it wasn't just about the money, but it was the, actually there's a hell of a lot of work that's going to be required here. Um, but look, McCoy, I've just seen the time. We'll draw things down to a close, but thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to have the show and such a pleasure to have you back. Nick, it's been great talking to you. I really appreciate it. Uh, hopefully we'll see you again soon. Great stuff. Well, thanks so much for joining us. And for everyone listening at home, thank you so much for tuning in, guys. If you haven't already hit the subscribe button, check out the Growth Hub. Go to wwspodcast.com. Check out the Growth Hub. Go join it. We'll let you in as soon as possible. There is a waiting list, um, which is nearly finished, and it keeps growing every time we release another episode of the podcast. So hope to see you guys in there. Hope to see you again next Friday when we post our next episode. Thanks for tuning in. Do you want to up your influencer marketing game? Do you want to meet more influencers, have a better working relationship with influencers? You might even be struggling to talk to them in the first place or even get them to talk about your product and post it to their audiences. Well, at Winning with Shopify, we have teamed up with Affluencer, which is an app you can install on Shopify and it comes with a 30-day trial. And even in those first 30 days, you can meet a load of influencers and start promoting your product. So there's no excuse. Go and install the app, start the 30-day trial and give it a go yourself and see how you get on.